Yes, and if all the adults uh, were, as, were, as, oh, no. were as free and open as, as this young man is in, in their dress code, wouldn't our churches look different? And, in, and as brave and bold as you are. <laughs> How are you this morning? Good. Good. Got a couple things here. Uh, yeah. you to give it a shot. This is a deck of cards. No, I'm not going to do card tricks. Uh, it's actually, uh, my mother would probably allow these cards in church. Otherwise, she would not allow me to bring playing cards in church. Uh, try to build a, uh, a just a simple little uh, four-sided house with these. You can do it up here or you can do it here. Why don't you do it on that book right there? See if you can just stack those to where they, they look like a little four-sided house. <coughs> Kind of hard when I put you on the spot, isn't it? How about I help you? Because we're just do it together. Okay, there's two sides. There's the other side. You get that one. Not easy, is it? I bet you and I could do it, though, if we worked at it a little bit. Okay. Uh, have you ever seen somebody build uh, these houses out of cards that are really tall? Yeah. And they build them way up, maybe, maybe five, ten floors of those cards? And then what happens if just the tiniest little problem in one of those cards? It looks like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it looks like that. The whole thing comes crashing down. And so that's kind of... What I want us to think about this morning is, is you know, we like to build things as, as people, don't we? We like to build houses of cards. We like to build houses out of pieces of wood. We like to build gigantic buildings and bridges out of steel and concrete. We're always building, aren't we? And we very, when we get finished with those big buildings and stuff, we can step back and look at them and go, you know, that's pretty cool. I, I built that. Or I, I was part of that building project. So we're always building things. But this morning, I want us to think about all of our great accomplishments in those buildings, even churches. Jesus is telling us this morning that nothing lasts forever. And it doesn't. All of those buildings that someday are either going to fall down or need to be replaced. And they're certainly going to need to be uh, worked on in order to keep them strong and sturdy. Nothing ever lasts forever. And so when we find ourselves focusing on too much on all of those things that don't last forever, whether it's buildings or, or whether it's um, all of our stuff or whether it's nations or governments or anything, when we focus on too much of that, we start to lose focus on what Jesus wants us to be. And that is a little more like that. See if you can get that out. Yeah, it's kind of hard to stick your finger in there. Yeah. Okay, so you Alright, so so Jesus wants to think a little bit more, less about all of our buildings, all of our accomplishments, all of our stuff, and hold that, hold that up a little bit and kind of work it in your hand. He wants us to focus on what it means to follow God. And God has been described as a potter, and we've been described as a clay. So God is always working with us. You can make a shape like that, or you can make a bowl, or you can do lots with Play-Doh or clay, can't you? And that's kind of way, the way we are in God's eyes and in God's hands. God's never going to make us into something that is going to be unchangeable, or is going to stand the test of, of time. 
God's always working in and with us so that we can always be creating new ways to love one another and to serve one another and to be good followers of Jesus Christ. Make sense? Okay, very good. Let's pray. Dear God, we, we do get focused on all of our grand accomplishments and all of our stuff sometimes. And just help us to, to find comfort in knowing that we are clay in the potter's hand. God is always working with us, molding us, moving us to be better followers through God's Spirit, better followers of Jesus and better people in our world who love one another. So just uh, keep molding us, dear God. Keep using us and molding us by your Spirit. Amen. Thank you. And as long as you don't eat that, you can have it. Okay. Yeah. Jesus replied, 
Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming that I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. These are words of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, except for some rather awkward family photos from the 1960s, I, I don't remember a lot of our beach trips down to the coast. We, we lived up in Morganton, and we really only a few times actually traveled down to the beach. But, but I can still remember as a small child playing in that wonderful zone between the, the land and the water along the strand, along the beach. I think my fascination with that, that zone, that area, actually led me to pursue a degree in marine technology after I graduated from high school. Maybe, like, like me, one of your favorite things is to build sandcastles. Well, most of my sandcastles were a little more than a a bucket of sand turned over and moved around there, pretty much just a, a blob, maybe adorned with a seashell here or there, or a little seaweed for some shrubbery. As a child, I did learn very quickly what waves could do to sandcastles. So I would build my sandcastle as strong as I could. I would make a little wall around the front of it, and it didn't take long to realize I needed a wall behind it as well as the as the waves receded. Sometimes I would also dig a moat uh, around my sand castle and let it fill with water and it became my little aquarium where I would put some of the sea creatures that I, that I found to live in my water-filled moat. There's something about building sand castles that attracts onlookers and amateur sand castle architects and contractors and directors from the ages of 2 to 92. People just seem to be drawn to, to them. They casually stop to chat or maybe offer some, some advice or some sandcastle encouragement. What a wonderful time those can be. Until, that is, that one person usually comes or always seems to show up that person who, who shatters every sandcastle builder's dream with, with those few words. You know, it, it's not going to be long before the tide comes in. I guess that's the greatest lesson learned by every first-time sandcastle builder. And that is, despite all of their imagination and all of their hard work and satisfaction, the waves are eventually <coughs> going to come, reshaping sandcastles forever. Well, Jesus, he steps into a bunch of, of proud Israelites who are ooing and eyeing over the inspiring grandeur of this magnificent temple in Jerusalem. And then like that person who strolls up to sandcastles, Jesus, and then he points out the reality of what was coming. Challenges the, challenges the moment by predicting the destruction of the very place that was for the Jewish people their grand building accomplishment. A place that they, they expected to, to be there. They depended on their, it being there for many, many years to come. And now Jesus, he describes the ongoing persecution that the, the Roman authorities were going to, to bring. It was going to destroy the one thing that held the people together, their temple. It was their not only their religious identity, it was their social identity. It was all going to be washed away. Well, I don't know about you, but... If I had been there and, and heard Jesus make that kind of prediction, uh, the first thing that I would want to do maybe is, is or that I might say is, oh my God, uh, when is this going to happen? I, I need to get ready. I need to prepare. I need more details, Jesus. And such was the response of the people as they pressed Jesus for further details. And, and so then Jesus lays out with broad brushstrokes what it would look and, 
feel and be like when the very identity of a religious institution and a nation becomes unraveled. Well, I think when we read this type of literature in the Bible, this biblical apocalyptic literature, it's, it's generally thought of as giving warnings. But it's also, in most cases, literature that gives us hope. It gives us direction to help us to, to know what to do when we're facing challenging circumstances. More specifically, in our literature from this morning, from the Gospel of Jude, of Luke, Jesus is saying, you know, there's always going to be natural disasters. There's always going to be extreme kind of challenges. There's always going to be false prophets. Don't get caught up in all of that. Don't follow them. Instead, I think, Jesus was wanting his followers to focus in a different direction. While nearing the end of his ministry, Jesus was trying to prepare his followers for what was about to come. Don't follow these signs. Don't focus on what, when, and where. It's all going to go down. Instead, prepare yourselves for following me, he seemed to be saying. But living in the first century, following Jesus meant someone might face persecution, sometimes imprisonment, and even death. There was a price for following Jesus beyond crumbling temples and, and the uncertainty of all of these worldly challenges. You see, Jesus was inviting followers to explore what it might mean to be shaped through their participation in a new unfolding kingdom. Shaped by the reign of God. So as followers of Jesus, how might you and I be, be shaped by God's reign? Well, first of all, it seems like in our scripture this morning, Jesus wants us to focus beyond buildings. You know, it wasn't too long ago that much of life in communities, whether it was small towns or, or even in big cities, life was centered around the local church where people and families would gather for, for lots of different types of meetings. They would also gather to worship. They would gather to, to learn. They would gather to share fellowship. Much of the social framework of community was tied to what went on in the four walls of the local church. Maybe that's why it's so hard for us to imagine and embrace a world that's so much less tied to churches as the number one gathering places for their communities. They're still gathering, but lots of other ways and lots of other places. It's hard sometimes for us not to not to link all of those challenges of our of our world to link them together with all the challenges of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus, it seems to be trying to get us first to focus on the challenges of following Him. Because those who follow Jesus, they need to be prepared for that work. You know, worldly challenges, they can, they can cause lots of issues in churches. They can cause churches to literally break apart over some of the, some of the most silly and simple stuff, like, like what color should be the, the chairs or the pews that we put back after we repaint the church or, or redo the floor. I've seen that happen so many times. Worldly challenges can also cause issues in churches like our, like our United Methodist Church. We, we found ourselves wrangling over biblical interpretation and politics and money and, and even division over who to love or accept. Rather than following Jesus and just sort of what it means to reach out to the lives of the least and the most in our world. Even though we might be separate going forward, we can still reclaim our focus. Can't we? 
combining worldly challenges with discipleship with discipleship challenges, they can cause people to struggle in lots of churches. Can cause people to get worried, sick over what might happen if they're not able to keep their doors open for all sorts of reasons. And it, but Jesus calls us to look past all of that, to focus on following Him, because that's where God's reign does its shaping. That's where the hard, and the risky, and yes, the sometimes life-altering work of being Christ to our world, Christ to our community, that's where that takes place. Walls crumble. Waves of change never stop. And castles, no matter how grand they are, they don't last forever. But when we choose to follow Jesus, to challenge whatever it is that is standing in the way of God's unfolding reign of justice and mercy and peace. Yes, we do need to be prepared for that. The Apostle Paul and Peter and many of the disciples and many of those early saints, they risked their very lives to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ while they were forming those early churches. I wonder if we were asked how much risk are we willing to face in order to allow God's Spirit to, to guide us in forming the next relevant church here in this area. During the early first century, Christians, they would face some of the most horrific persecution at the hands of, of all kinds of people and powers who felt threatened by this message of God's unfolding reign. In some parts of our world today, Christians are persecuted and, and even facing imprisonment and even death for, for carrying that message. You see, Jesus tells his followers, though, to first focus on that. Not pews, not chairs, not buildings, not who's in, not who's out. Not even on all of the world's challenges that are spinning around us. So how do we prepare ourselves for that kind of focus? For that kind of devotion? For that kind of, of service? For that kind of sacrifice of which Christ calls us to? Well, that's a good question. It's a long question. A, it requires a long answer probably, but we could start in some, some very simple ways. <clears throat> my first natural response might be to, to pull out my Bible and to dig more deeply the, the truth behind the truth, the layers of context, the layers of meaning that lie in deep Bible study. It's there waiting for us if we're willing to, to engage ourselves in that. We might deepen our prayer life. We might learn new ways to pray, to have that holy interaction and meditation and conversation with God. We can always deepen our prayer life. You know, we, we might study up or brush up or dig more deeply into our Wesleyan theology so that we can understand the unique way that we encounter God's grace through being Methodist. So many challenges within this world that, that seems to be unraveling faster and faster. But maybe Jesus was trying to get us to focus a little higher than all of those worldly challenges. I wonder if Jesus wasn't trying to say, don't spend your time only on trying to figure all of that out. He seemed to be saying, all of that worldly stuff, that's about you. That's about your same castle. So how do we prepare? What Jesus tells us. He tells us to wait. He didn't tell us to do nothing. He told us to wait. Maybe that waiting is an opportunity for Ross to dig more deeply into Scripture, into our prayer life into service to others. And then he tells us to trust. 
and to put God's Spirit in our hearts. I think Jesus was saying that no matter what challenges come your way or come our way, and they surely will, if we keep Jesus alive in our hearts, our responses no longer become solely about us or our fears or our sandcastles. Even though we might not face persecution and imprisonment and death in the same way as other followers, we're still going to be faced with some difficult challenges when we choose to allow God's reign to shape our lives and our world. We're so pulled apart. You have to be this side. You have to be that side. And if we step in as Christians and counter that and refocus others and help them understand and, and point them to God's grace, we will pay a price for that. Because it means standing up to that, whichever side it is. And we need to be prepared for that. The good news is, when we focus on, on Jesus, God's Spirit prepares our hearts for the journey. Then no matter what challenges or, or limitations you might be facing personally or, or as a church, we can still make a difference in shaping our world through God's reign of justice, and mercy, compassion, peace, and love. So why not? Rather than, than focusing on the past and being so sad and, and thinking that, oh, what, what, what we don't have anymore, why not be joyful? Why not thank God for another day to follow Jesus, to better understand what it truly means to focus on Him? Why not be joyous for the opportunity to be shaped by His reign, to be able in whatever way to once again step into the lives of the least and the lost without hesitation with the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ? For God's promise to be with us always, it goes with us always. No matter who we are or where we carry that message. This is the good news of Jesus Christ for us this day and every day. I can remember waking up early in the morning and and running out on the beach to see if my grand sandcastle had withstood the, the tides over, overnight. And although my magnificent castle was nowhere to be found, somehow that really didn't matter. Maybe it was because once again I was surrounded with the sand, the sounds of splashing feet and giggles from sandcastle builder Gold and Young, all thankful to have just one more day to be shaped by a wondrous God of creation and grace, who through Jesus Christ and by God's Holy Spirit is never finished creating opportunities for all people to be shaped by God's reign of justice and mercy and love. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us to refocus our lives and ourselves, to prepare our hearts for what it really means to follow Christ into our world today and tomorrow. And thank you, O oh God of creation, for creating the joy of sandcastles. I invite you to stand and join us in our closing hymn.
hymn of promise. Let us stand.